Many years ago, I was in church with friends. Our children walked with us up the aisle of the church, warm smiles from those we passed. There's Rosemary in her wheelchair. Her family founded the church. The musician who teaches all of the children in town, friends, neighbors, that person in the pew over there that I really never talked to, but they're always there so they seem like family. Familiar, comforting, challenging. Some careworn faces, some smooth. We knelt to receive the bread and the wine. The children's little pudgy hands reaching up for the bread. Their eyes bright with expectation. Legs still for just a second. We turned from the altar rail and the kids race off to go outside to play games, to burn off all the energy from 50 minutes of worship. And I sink to kneel down next to my friends other moms, other parents who are equally grateful for a moment of silence, a moment free from wiggling bodies and motion and buzz, a priest, a lawyer, a doctor, a writer. We're all navigating together the complicated work of parenting, and balancing our lives of work and parenting and play. And we breathe in the silence and enter into prayer with our church gathered. The pause before prayer starts, prayer already rising up. And in that moment, I knew. I knew that I belonged, that I was beloved, that this was my family. Paul understood about this exact kind of connection and belonging. And I can just imagine him, can't you, sitting at a desk looking out over the sea, staring out the window and gathering his thoughts about this church that he'd started a few years earlier. Writing to a people who had kind of forgot a little bit about their identity and their connection and their power. We can infer what a group or a culture is working on or struggling with by the letters they write, the laws they make, the songs and plays that they create. And the church in Corinth obviously and clearly was struggling with issues of spiritual gifts. I wonder if they maybe had priority over some gifts and less so about others. I wonder if there was said, you're not really a Christian if you don't have the same gifts that I have. I've heard that before. Maybe you're not a real Christian if you don't see things the same way I see them. They had descended into Factions. And if you read all of Corinthians, you can see that they're engaging in immoral and unethical behavior, legal disputes. They're arguing about worship. They couldn't even figure out how to eat together without arguing about the issues around food and how to gather at the table. Now, a group or a community that is deeply divided cannot function at the most basic of levels. They can't dream dreams or articulate a vision or accomplish their mission. And eating a meal together can be excruciating. You and I have been at those tables before, haven't we? Into that painful chaos, Paul drops some encouragement, guidance, and wisdom. There are many gifts and one spirit. There are many parts and one body. And he goes on to say, if there is not love, then all of it is worthless. 
We cannot say, I have no need of you, because we are in fact one body. And more than just a collection of different parts, we're a connection of many relationships. The Corinthian church is asking difficult questions, how to worship together, how are we going to disagree, and how will we treat each other when we do? How can we honor the gifts in one another when maybe we don't really value the gifts in the other or agree with that person or even respect who they are? Really, they have quite modern issues, don't they? These are questions of connection, relationship, acceptance, and belonging. And if you have ever walked into school or work on a hard day or even a regular day and tried to figure out where to sit or who to talk to, if you're upset with your hair or your clothes or your friends dealing with the roller coaster of gossip or hurt feelings, academics, exhilaration and opportunity, energy and exhaustion, and all of that happens in work and at school, no matter how old you are, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You pretty much understand what's going on in Corinth. They are people like you and me trying to figure out how to live in community together. Now, the queen of authentic connection and true belonging is, of course, you're probably thinking of her name, Dr. Brene Brown who describes the essential aspects of transcendent community like this. She writes in Braving the Wilderness that, quote, building a true belonging practice is maintaining our belief in the inextricable human connection. That connection, the spirit that flows between us and every other human in the world, is not something that can be broken. However, our belief in the connection is constantly tested and repeatedly severed. When our belief that there's something greater than us, something rooted in love and compassion breaks, then we are more likely to retreat to our bunkers, to hate from afar, to tolerate BS, and to dehumanize others. She goes on to talk about our current climate of division and polarization, the ways in which we are hating on one another in our broader world. And she says about this, quote, Addressing this crisis will require a tremendous amount of courage. For the moment, most of us are either making the choice to protect ourselves from conflict, discomfort, and vulnerability by staying quiet or picking sides, and in the process, adopting the behavior of the people with whom we passionately disagree. Either way, the choices we are making to protect our beliefs are leaving us disconnected afraid and lonely. The data that emerged from the research on the belonging can start to connect some of the dots around why we are sorted but lonely and perhaps contribute new insight into how we can reclaim authenticity and connection. She goes on to say that this connection is grounded in spirituality. And this, my friends, is something that we are really good at. We know the world of the spiritual life. We are living spiritual disciplines. We have this as an inheritance given to us. Dr. Brown says, quote, 
Spirituality is recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than all of us and that our connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and compassion. Practicing spirituality brings a sense of perspective, meaning, and purpose to our lives. End quote. Dr. Brown understands both academically, and if you've read her work, she gets it personally, about the world of the spirit and the discipline of living a spiritual life and the ways that ritual and religion can contribute to and sometimes, quite honestly, fray that sense of belonging. So look around this space. And if you're at home, look around your space or remember the sacred spaces of your heart. Our sacred stones, the wood, the shared song, cadence, prayer, all of this gives voice and structure and location to our longing for connection. What we do here binds us together as we enter, kneel, pray, sing, bless, receive, and serve. When I first came here to discern if I was called to serve you, the most important thing I did was to come into this sacred space and sit quietly and listen. I wanted to hear what was happening in the silence. And I felt the prayers that have saturated the wood of this place. I could hear the echo of generations and generations singing and praying, lifting up in prayer the needs of the community around us. This spiritual echo from all of you and all who enter this space. And I knew, I knew in that moment that this is a vibrant and holy church. Sacred, steady, grounded in the spirit. This is what makes this time so achingly difficult. The disrupted and enormous effort in order to even worship or study or learn to connect and serve and be together. The pandemic has disrupted us so on so many levels and we struggle. But what we have done and what we are doing is worthy and good. We have held fast. We have stayed strong and steady but our isolation still remains painful and there are deep wounds still. And for many of us, the deep loneliness of our lives might, right now is an unbearable ache. Our work, our work as a church is to stay present to one another in that pain and to find places of healing and joy and connection, because that is what we do. It is who we are. And the great gift of the church in this time for the whole world. And this time is unique in that we are more than ever required to work together. Never before have our challenges and solutions both rested more purely on our abilities to stay in community and to understand ourselves to be one body, to know one another and the world around us and to bring our gifts and our strength. Dr. Brown writes that, quote, people are hard to hate up close. So if we are people of love, and we are, we are people who believe in the power of Christ's love, then we're required to get curious about one another, 
to get close to one another, but not closer than six feet and wearing masks, please. <laughs> Just like the church in Corinth, we carry collective grief and Paul speaks to the heart of it. Many gifts, one spirit. Many parts, one body. And all of it is useless without love. You are not alone. You belong here. You are a part of this body. You are loved, essential, and powerful. Hold fiercely to this gift of grace that transcends our understanding, bridges our distances and divisions, and binds us together within the mystical body of Christ. Amen.